Tēnā koutou katoa. Ko te whanga nui a tara tōku whenua tūpu, ko tōku kāinga hoki. Ko taranaki whanui ki te opo ko te ika, rato ko te ati awa, ko nati toa rangatira, ko mō upoko, nā iwi mana whenua o konei. He tangata tūriti a hau. He mema o te International Socialist Organization a hau. Ko Sarah, tōku ingoa. What is fascism and how do we fight it? This title intentionally echoes the title given to a collection of Leon Trotsky's writings on the subject. Trotsky obviously carries a lot more mana than I in analysis, organizing and fighting fascist menace. I'm using that collection of writings as one of several touchstones for this discussion because I think Trotsky's analysis is highly relevant today. I truly hope I can do justice to this echo from one of the figures the International Socialist Organization claims in its analytical heritage. But I also hope to extend the discussion beyond what fascism meant to people in Trotsky's time. It's been 83 years since the most recent of Trotsky's writings from that collection. And I think you'll agree that in that time, there have been many social and economic developments, adaptations, analyses, commentaries, struggles, wins, and losses. Let's take a little time to consider what fascism is, how it looks in today's world, and what we can do, are doing, to fight it in the present day. First though, a brief note and warning. I will be talking about fascism and fascists. It isn't a nice subject. I won't be going into gory details or showing gruesome images, although those certainly exist because fascists have done some truly horrendous things. This talk will, however, include some uncomfortable imagery, symbols, and discussion. With that in mind, please know that it's okay to step out from this talk at any time, uh, that you see fit to look after your well-being. So what is fascism? It's a term that's been thrown around in casual conversation and political argument to describe everyone from egotistical presidents to Antifa to public health workers to man babies. But the Nazis were defeated in 1945, back in a time when most movies were still in black and white, back before commercial jetliners existed, before the polio vaccine, before personal computers or GPS, and even before Wikipedia. It's ridiculous that we'd be dredging up something so ancient and done with, and that we'd been applying the label to people in the present day, right? To help us better understand what fascism is, let's consider first its form and then its function. That is, first what it looks and feels like, and then what its purpose is. So, fasces is the name for a bundle of sticks carried by state authorities in ancient Rome, apparently as a symbol of justice. The sticks themselves could be used to mete out physical punishment, and the bundle, sometimes depicted with an axe, represents the potential for capital punishment. In 1919, a little over a century ago, Benito Mussolini founded the Fasci Italiani di Combattimento, the Italian Combat Leagues. Fasci in this context simply meaning groups. And over the next several years, Mussolini ended up developing a whole new political doctrine, which he named fascism. And the fascists were chosen as a symbol of a glorified Roman past and the justice the fascists imagined bringing to Italy. Here are Mussolini's words describing the doctrine. Fascism does not, generally speaking, believe in the possibility or utility of perpetual peace. It therefore discards pacifism as a cloak for cowardly, supine renunciation in contradistinction to self-sacrifice. War alone keys up all human energies to their maximum tensions and sets the seal of nobility on those people who have the courage to face it. And also, the fascist accepts and loves life. He rejects and despises suicide as cowardly. Life, as he understands it, means duty, elevation, conquest. Life must be lofty and full, must be lived for oneself, but above all others, both nearby and far off, present and future. You might already be getting a sense of this philosophy glorifying violence and channeling some deeply conservative values, including that weird niche of individuality that does not actually include bodily autonomy. So around the same time, Hitler had joined the so-called German Workers' Party, a group which anti-fascist journalist Paul Mason describes as dedicated to anti-communism, state ownership, authoritarian government, and anti-Semitism. 
The group soon changed their name to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, which Mason states was done so that uh, Nazism could be sold, initially to the masses, as a nationalist revolt against capitalism. The German term for National Socialist was mispronounced by English speech speakers as Nazi, uh, and so we end up with that term in our modern lexicon. The beginnings of Hitler's Mein Kampf describe intensely impoverished economic and social circumstances that wouldn't have been out of place in Karl Marx's capital. Uh, however, whereas Marx was motivated to address such problems by working towards a more egalitarian future, Hitler's approach was instead to blame Jews and socialists. Hitler quickly rose to prominence as an orator, though apparently not so much as a writer. His manifesto is as much a personal fanfic as it is political work, but nonetheless showcases his belief in the necessity of hierarchy and violence. Just as nature, these are his words, uh, does not concentrate her greatest attention in preserving what exists, but in breeding offspring to carry on the species, likewise in human life, it is less important artificially to alleviate existing evil, which in view of human nature is 99% possible, than to ensure the from the start, healthier channels for a future development. And also, only when epoch ceases to be haunted by the shadow of its own consciousness of guilt, will it achieve the inner calm and outward strength, brutally and ruthlessly to prune off the wild shoots and tear out the weeds. Those quotations from Mussolini and Hitler express a degree of fanaticism, and it seems fascism is appealing particularly to those who feel wronged and either downtrodden or at risk of losing status. So Clara Zetkin described this appeal. We must realize that fascism is a movement of the disappointed and those whose existence is ruined. We must realize that they're not only trying to escape from their present tribulations, but they are longing for a new philosophy. And according to Mason, for fascists, a myth is not a fantasy or superstition. It's a story you can make come true by believing in it hard enough and centering your life around it. So there have been <clears throat> many numerous attempts to ca characterize fascism. Umberto Eco's 1995 list of features of fascism is one of the most well-known. And these are my words, uh, an attempt to summarize um, his list. Uh, cult of tradition, irrational, promoting action for action's sake through permanent struggle and warfare, upholding a fantasy of personal heroism and machismo, unable to tolerate disagreement and fearing difference, restricting language to restrict cultural thought and criticism, deriving from individual or social frustration and a sense of being besieged by an arbitrary, powerful other with a selection of the population considered to be the people and decisions handed down by a self-appointed voice of people. Um, various other attempts to characterize fascism. Um, researcher Roger Griffin provided this definition in 1991, fascism is a genus of pol political ideology whose mythic core and its various permutations is a palingenic, uh, which means reborn form of populist ultranationalism. Um, Mason um, created this succinct, and I think maybe somewhat lacking, definition. Fascism is the fear of freedom triggered by a glimpse of freedom. And the third international led by Stalinist USSR labelled social democracy as the moderate wing of fascism, um, and thus conflated the entire spectrum of capitalism with fascism. Defining fascism is clearly tricky, and some descriptions and definitions are more useful than others. So Mussolini created this doctrine of fascism, that's with a capital F referring specifically to interwar, World War II, uh, Italy. Uh, and Hitler is the leader of the most renowned fascist regime thus far. So lowercase f referring to fascism as a general um, political ideology. However, it's important to note that neither of these individuals invented fascism in any sort of ideological void. Mason identifies philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche's of, uh, ideas of the Superman or Ubermensch um, and of positive eugenics as some of the cultural precursors of fascism and says fascism sprang more fundamentally from the wider culture of colonialism, nationalism and militarism that flourished among conservative-minded people before the First World War. 
reading this, we might start to be getting an uncomfortable awareness that those precursors of fascism are also present in our own colonial New Zealand heritage. So now we've got an idea of a social context in which fascism arose and a sample of the attempts to describe fascism. Let's turn our attention to discussing what fascism actually does. If we return to post-World War I period for a moment, uh, we can observe the social forces of the time which fascism was engaged to counter. The world's capitalists were having to come to terms with a successful revolution in Russia, and the potential for revolution spread everywhere. Returned Italian soldiers, inspired by the Russian Revolution, started farming unused land. The exploited peasant class went on mass strike until they were able to guarantee co-management of the farms they worked. In factories, workers set up factory councils similar to those established by Russian workers, and they undertook multi-day strikes for improved conditions. Socialists won a third of Italy's popular vote, becoming the largest group in parliament, uh, while in Germany, economic hardships and social unrest led socialists um, sorry, it led to socialists setting up citizen protection squads. The anti-capitalists and liberal parties together held nearly half of parliament and industrial strikes and rent strikes proliferated. In response, the ruling class of Italy gave Mussolini increasingly free reign to suppress first peasant farm occupations, then whole working class movements, then the entire democratic process. Mussolini was very clear about his goal of ensuring the subjugation of the working class. In his words, fascism was the absolute negation of the doctrine underlying so-called scientific and Marxian socialism. And fascism denies the equation well-being equals happiness, which sees in men mere animals, content when they can feed and fatten, thus reducing them to a vegetative existence, pure and simple. Similarly, Hitler appealed to Germans, Germany's industrial elite by offering to destroy any chance of working class uprising. Martin Neumoller's favorite, uh, famous poem starts with, first they came for the socialists because the Nazis' first target was the labor movement. Ralph Mannheim, who translated Mein Kampf, noted that the particular style of German writing Hitler used appeared to appeal to the petty, petty bourgeoisie. According to Clara Zetkin, Fascism is the concentrated expression of the general offensive undertaken by the world bourgeoisie against the proletariat. Trotsky described this offensive in a context of three stages of capitalism, its dawn, its bloom, and its decline, which is when the bourgeoisie is forced to resort to methods of civil war against the proletariat to protect its right of exploitation. Trotsky also described fascism as a razor in the hands of the class enemy. In other words, fascism is the political program deployed by the ruling class to maintain their power. So further quote from uh, Trotsky, describing fascism as special armed gangs specifically trained to fight workers like certain breeds of dog are trained to hunt game. The historical role of fascism is to crush the working class, destroy, destroy its organizations and stifle political freedom at a time when the capitalists are conscious that they have become incapable of governing or dominating through democratic system. We earlier discussed how fascists may not view themselves as being a tool of the working class and, oh, sorry, of the ruling class, my apologies. Um, and it seems that many academics who study fascism believe that if fascists succeeded in their own goals, they might create some sort of society that was neither capitalist nor socialist, uh, but some alternative. Um, and if that is true, then certainly when capitalists support fascists, they're taking a risk that might backfire on them. So on this, Trotsky said rather eloquently, the big bourgeoisie likes fascism as little as a man with making aching molars likes to have his teeth pulled. So Gramsci theorized that fascism might also be capable of gradually eroding the capitalist system until it had achieved a passive revolution. And those living in the USA and the UK, for example, may well feel like Gramsci has a point as they watch hard-won rights being eroded before their very eyes. From our perspective on the left, we certainly see the capitalist class, including the bourgeois state, enabling fascists and the early growth of fascist ideas from police protecting fascists rallying and marching to large national and multimedia, uh, sorry, multinational media companies promoting fascist talking points 
to petty bourgeois business owners directly financing and supporting far-right mobilizations, to billionaires promoting so-called free speech, which protects far-right fascist attacks on minorities in social media and other online spaces. It certainly appears that right now, as capitalism is being increasingly challenged by renewed interest in socialist ideas, by bank collapses, by logistical failures, and so on, the capitalists are once again more and more willing to cede ground to fascists to counter challenges from the left. So if fascists identify themselves explicitly, then that's obviously pretty handy. But um, note that while identifying their symbolism can be useful, um, only looking at symbolism might lead us to draw incorrect conclusions because symbols can be used for a variety of reasons. So an example that I've got here, um, fascis, um, which inspired Mussolini um, and were the symbol of Italian fascism. Um, they've also been used by the British Union of Fascists, uh, who well, they identify themselves, so that's fantastic, uh, but also a symbol of state of the USA. There it is on a USA coin and in the background of the House of Representatives. Um, so I think we just have to be a little bit cautious about just looking at the symbols, which is why we've been going into so much detail about form and function. Uh, similarly, the swastika, uh, appropriated by the Nazis, is prominently displayed by the mongrel mob, um, not as a, with a goal of white supremacy, obviously in that particular um, representation, I guess, um, but is adapted in the far-right Kekistan meme, which is um, certainly um, promoting a white supremacist um, philosophy. So more reliably than just focusing on symbolism, we should try to determine whether an individual or group is fascist through its um, form and function. So to summarize what we've got so far, we've established that fascism exists in opposition to concepts of fair and egalitarian systems of social organization. And fascists are therefore enabled, encouraged or deployed by capitalists as a high risk tool to suppress the left when capitalism is under threat. Fascists believe in and value hierarchies, so when a leader emerges in a nationalist context, then fascism is authoritarian, but there are other forms of authoritarianism than just fascism. Fascists vilify one or more groups of others who are used as both scapegoat and a focus for rallying against and desire to recreate some idealized vision of history wherein the other was subjugated or imagined non-existent. And fascists view violence as useful, um, more than just useful, they uphold it as, um, as, as a highly valued um, action. Um, and they view violence as appropriate to establish and maintain hierarchies and to punish the other. Um, in other words, fascism is all of the following, anti-egalitarian, hierarchical and authoritarian, exclusionary and othering, glorifying of an idealized past, and violent and vindictive. So to explore the application of these criteria, let's briefly consider a few modern day real world and pop culture individuals and groups in a uh, quick fire round of are they fascist? So, Freedom and Rights Coalition in Aotearoa. Uh, this is led by Destiny Church pastor Brian Tamaki. This group promotes COVID conspiracism, is against queer people, and against abortion rights. It certainly adheres to religious fundamentalism, conservatism, othering, and has a not so subtle threat of violence in its speeches and rallies. While perhaps not quite so explicitly anti-egalitarian, hierarchical and pro-violence as to be fascist, um, it certainly sits very nearby on a political spectrum. And so uh, we could comfortably call this group far right. <laughs> Real world and pop culture examples. The Galactic Empire in the Star Wars movies, uh, led by Emperor Palpatine, I'm led to believe. Um, the Galactic Empire is depicted as hierarchical and authoritarian and extremely violent. While its actions are clearly anti-egalitarian, it isn't clear that it primarily exists to smash the working class. 
The Empire doesn't seem to engage in othering at a systemic level, other than to maintain its power, and to my knowledge, doesn't aim to recreate a heroic past. Although George Lucas channeled Nazi imagery for his visual portrayal of the Empire, it seems that this is uh, authoritarian and dystopian, um, but I wouldn't say fascist. Um, the Oath Keepers in the USA, uh, consisting of several thousand members across the USA. Uh, this is a so-called militia or patriot movement alongside groups like the Three Percenters and the Atom Waffen Division. Uh, the Oath Keepers are extremely and explicitly anti-socialist, hierarchical, othering of people of colour and of Muslim people. Um, wants to recreate an idealised historical USA and are extremely and explicitly violent. They fit all of the criteria discussed earlier, and I definitely would call this group fascist. Uh, here's our friend from <laughs> a month or two ago, uh, Posey Parker from the UK. So a YouTube personality who's primarily known for her anti-transgender posturing. She seems at home with conservatives, has an identified other and transgender people. She seems happy to hint towards violence, and we can assume she would be happy with violence being carried out against her chosen other. It's been suggested that she's fascist given the support that she's received from fascists and the sponsorship that she's received from far-right groups and so forth. However, she's um, while she seems to be an intensely unpleasant person and opportunistically hinting towards fascist ideas, um, she does not quite currently fit the criteria for actually being a fascist herself. So I would again say fascist adjacent perhaps, but not fascist. Uh, Counterspin Media in Aotearoa. Uh, this is the budget Aotearoa version of USA's Infowars or Daily Wire, uh, operated by Kelvin Alp and Hannah Spira. Uh, Counterspin is certainly anti-left and extremely conservative in their politics. Uh, promotion of COVID conspiracism and sharing footage of the Christchurch mosque shooting certainly ticks the boxes for othering and promotion of violence. Um, I'm not clear on whether these people have an explicitly stated um, vision of a, some sort of heroic past, but they do seem to oppose the colonial efforts, uh, which does suggest that they would like to go or at least maintain um, colonialism. Um, it does seem that Counterspin um, meets the criteria for promoting fascist ideas, um, even if they're a laughing stock. I would say fascist enabling rather than necessarily obviously fascist as such. Uh, so let's talk about anti-fascism. Um, from historical experience, ignoring or appeasing fascism guarantees fascist political space in which to grow their movement. Trotsky said only audacious mobilization of the workers against reaction creation of a workers' militia, direct physical resistance to fascist gangs, increasing self-confidence, activity, and audacity on the part of all of the oppressed can provoke a change in the relation of forces, stop the world wave of fascism, and open a new chapter in the history of mankind. And notably, he was writing that in 1938, the start of World War II. If fascists weren't opposed, and if they were allowed to grow to a point where they openly mobilise the street gangs, then from what Trotsky is saying, uh, they would need to be opposed directly and physically. But what about when there are only a few isolated and mostly reclusive fascists rather than open gangs? What if far-right ideas that enable fascism um, without quite fitting a definition of fascism? What do we do in these cases? Should we mobilize against individuals or against the fascist adjacent? Um, this branch of the International Socialist Organization um, supports and is active within Porniki Anti-Fascist Coalition. This is a campaign organization made up of left, liberal, left, sorry, left and liberal activists with diverse experience, including from peace movements, climate activism, and abortion rights campaigns. Despite the need for political unity, to be able to assess, uh, access broad networks and to have people uh, to share this organising mahi, the ISO is currently the only socialist organisation active in PAFC. We're proud of our involvement in this collective work and since PAFC was formed following the 2022 far-right parliament occupation, 
we've already been able to contribute towards a number of useful pieces of work. In August last year, PAFC organized a 100 strong counter protest against Brian Tamaki's Freedom and Rights Coalition March on Parliament. In December last year, we worked together to protest against the anti abortion March for Life, blocking the street in front of them. This year, we've countered transphobes at Parliament and we've disrupted an anti Maori speaking tour, as well as providing support for several other rallies at Parliament and Civic Square. It's important to note that this work has been un undertaken in the context of 21st century Aotearoa and not early 20th century Europe. There are a couple of fine differences there. I'd like to highlight three significant differences that have been recently guiding PAFC's anti-fascist approach. Uh, so first, Aotearoa has suffered and still suffers from British colonialism and USA imperialism. This is visible in numerous forms such as historical attempts to erase te reo Māori, ongoing disproportionate state violence towards and incarceration of Māori, and the potential for extreme reaction against Māori, such as seen in the 2008 police raids against Tuhoi. Second, while racism is rampant and many people have resigned themselves to neoliberal ideology, and while there are some fascists and numerous far-right threats and enablers, across the motu. The situation isn't currently as dire as it was in Europe in the interwar period of last century. Third, we acknowledge that systemic social and economic failings create an environment in which far-right ideologies can gain a following, and we must leave open the possibility of rehabilitation and reintegration of some of the far-right's followers. So bearing these factors in mind, our approach has as much as possible been to organize nonviolent protests and disruption of the far right's propaganda rallies and to provide public education to inoculate against their toxic ideas. Thus far, this approach has been successful in resisting and undermining the foundations of fascist growth and in promoting anti-fascist ideas to a point where we've built up a reasonable anti-fascist following in social media. In addition, our organizing group has been gradually growing. In line with Trotsky's analysis, we've seen the need for anti-fascist work to be about mass mobilization and not isolated direct action of an ac activist core. And we've been successful in mobilizing hundreds of people for some of our rallies, which I view as a very good first step uh, with much more mahi to be done to continue building. As international socialists, we also understand that unless we overthrow capitalism, we'll always have to address the threat of fascism. Therefore, we support immediate changes which address the social and economic deprivation which provides fascism its soldiers while also seeking to build to where the whole working class can fundamentally replace capitalism with egalitarian distribution. So I'd like to just bring this all to a, a, a conclusion. Fascism is a threat which cannot be ignored. Unchecked fascism or fascists, sorry, would usher us into a brutal future absent of all that we love. We've developed a simplified criteria for identifying fascism uh, through this talk today, which was all of the following uh, to reiterate anti egalitarian, hierarchical and authoritarian, exclusionary and othering, um, glorifying of an idealized past, and violent and vindictive. We were able to use those criteria to consider whether various examples were fascist or not. We've covered how at least some fascists seem to believe that these pretty sad features of their ideology are somehow good, and that they imagine a revolution of their own making. However, despite fascists imagining themselves to be ubermensch, they are actually enabled and deployed to suit the needs of both bourgeoisie and petty bourgeoisie, specifically to crush working class uprising a manoeuvre that's both high risk for capitalists and devastating for the working class. To avoid such destructiveness, anti-fascism must become the norm in Aotearoa and around the world. To protect vulnerable populations throughout this work, anti-fascism must be anti-colonial and inclusive and organised from the roots up. To spread, it must communicate its ideas in terms that resonate with a relatively depoliticised society because to be successful, it must uh, connect and communicate with and mobilize the masses. 
All of this mahi is already well underway here in Te Whanganui Atara, and the ISO is proud to be a part of that communal effort. I started this talk with a brief mihi. As I'm Ngāti Pākehā and Tangata Tariti, doing so was an intentional and important acknowledgement of mana whenua and of te ao Māori. If fascism sprang from ideologies including colonialism, I don't believe I could reasonably have discussed anti-fascism in the context of Aotearoa without first taking that small step towards a decolonised space. Fascism is anti-egalitarian, hierarchical, exclusionary, glorifying of an idealised past and violent. And in contrast, anti-fascists in Aotearoa are making a conscious effort to support Tino Rangateratanga and to acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices against Māori and minority groups. We envisage an egalitarian and just future, inclusive and welcoming. I'd like to conclude with these words from Tony Cliff um, at the turn of the millennium. Um, to, uh, Cliff is another important figure in ISO's analytical heritage. I think these words beautifully summarise all of the last half hour's corridor, and I thank you all for taking the time to listen to all of us. Cliff says, because fascism is a movement of despair, while socialism is a movement of hope, to fight fascism it is necessary to not only fight the fascists, but also the conditions that lead to despair. One has to fight the rats, and also the sewers in which the rats multiply. One has to fight the fascists, but also capitalism that creates conditions that breed fascism. Unemployment, bad housing, social deprivation, and so forth. I hope you want to fight fascism. And I hope that you'll be a part of the socialist movement that can build towards a hope-filled future where fascism cannot ever take root. Namihi. <laughs>